Good day, my friends. We are here today for another program of Cats About Town on TVC 22, and our special guest today is our very own Member of Parliament, Pierre Lemieux. Pierre, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming out on your busy, busy day, which is just like any other day. <laughs> I can't believe the schedule that you keep up. I don't think that uh, you have quite enough gray hairs. You must be lying, I think. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm young. I'm young, but I have, uh, you know, life experience. You're That's the best young. way to put it. You are young. You are so full of energy and goodwill and good intent. You, I, I have absolutely no idea how you do this. We were talking a little bit about how some of your training in the military might have prepared you to keep going when you think you can't take another step? Yes, it, it, it's uh, the, having spent 20 years in the military, the military has certainly helped. Um, the military, uh, part of the military training and formation is to sort of uh, mount all obstacles in a sense to do what's important. Um, and certainly as an MP there are many challenges. Um, the days can be quite long. I was, um, for example, just talking to three different schools uh, yesterday about uh, the upcoming Flag Day mm -hmm. on February 15th. It's the 50th anniversary of Canada's flag, the way we know it today with the maple leaf. And uh, I was answering some of their questions and I was explaining to them a typical day for me when the house is sitting on the hill, where I would go into the hill at let's say 8.30 in the morning, and then I would generally get home at 8.30 or 9 or, or 9.30 at night. That's a very standard day. The day on the hill is very busy. Um, it's a lot of movement. I'm in my office for certain meetings, and I must go to the hill for debate. I might have to go to a committee meeting, back to the hill for question period, back to my office for another meeting, back up to the hill for um, uh, votes at the end of the day, because we vote on a lot of different bills and motions. Um, in order to, pa to pass laws or pass uh, bills into law. So by the time all that is done and I get home, yeah, I'm usually walking through the door. I would say on average it's nine, but sometimes it can be 10 o'clock at night. Sometimes it's 11. If there's a late or an emergency debate, it can be midnight. It can be one in the morning. So it's a demanding, it's a demanding life and you have to have uh, the energy to do it. And I, and I do have the energy. I've been, I've been doing the work now of NP for, for nine years, since 2006. Um, I really uh, count myself as honoured and privileged to be the Member of Parliament, to represent the people of our riding, and you find energy in that responsibility. Well, this is true. This is something that any, any parent finds out when they have to look after their kids yes, it's yet true. one yeah. more time. Now, I remember our last interview, you were telling me that the decision for you to go into politics was a family decision. It was. So um, none of it, nobody can complain, right? Yeah, and no, no one does complain. Um, my, my eldest daughter, she's 25 now, but she was 15, 16 at the time. Um, and it was her suggestion that I should run as an MP, which, of course, I really had no idea what she was really talking about. <laughs> she probably didn't either. <laughs> no. um, but it did lead to discussion around the table, certainly discussion with my wife. And it was very much a family decision because a decision to enter politics does affect your family. Um, you know, and you can just imagine coming home at nine at night would affect your family. But there's a great support and understanding within my family for the work that needs to be done. Mm -hmm. uh, and my wife and uh, my kids, they understand that this is important work. And um, in a sense, they also know, they also know that um, I'm not a workaholic in that sense. I'm, I work hard. Mm -hmm. I'm very efficient at what I do. Um, however, I also know that, okay, I must stop now and there are family events going on and I'm going to attend those family events. So it's finding, you have to find that balance. Um, and even though life can be very busy, you have to find the balance. And my family knows that I work hard with them to find that balance. And so we're, we're always working together is the way I look at it mm -hmm. um, on finding the balance between work life and political life and family life and just everything that's going on around us. And, and it's worked very well and uh, I'm very grateful to my family for the support that they give me. You're very fortunate. You, I am. Obviously you, you picked the right path and we are very fortunate to have somebody who can oh, pull it all you. together like that. Because we do demand a lot of our member of parliament. We demand a lot of our, all of our politicians. And we are always so quick to criticize. And so seldom are we grateful except at photo opportunities when the check comes in. <laughs> you do those very well, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> those are wonderful pictures of you. You do seem to be all over the place. And not, not all over the place as in scattered, but mm. everywhere. You, 
you really are, it's clear that you're putting your heart and soul into bringing as much as you can to Glengarry Pescott. I, I do put my heart and soul in, into being the Member of Parliament and I kind of describe uh, busy life up on the hill. It's a bit of a hidden life in a sense. The people that live in our riding uh, who are raising their families don't necessarily see any of what I just said that we do on the hill, which is important. Yeah. Um, so it is very important to be present in the riding as well. And the best way to be present is to actually attend events. Because mm -hmm. when an event is occurring, you're plugging into that event, plugging into that community. And one of the really nice things about our riding, there are many communities, and they all have their community spirit and their flavor mm -hmm. and their events, and they're unique to, their, to that community. And so by going to these events, I meet the people that I'm representing. I have uh, short or medium or long conversations with them on a range of issues and I can tell fairly quickly whether they're happy with a particular uh, thing that we're doing, if they have concerns about something that's happening in Canada, do they want to make a comment to me. Um, and you know, after I've been to you know, three or four events, let's say in a weekend, that's a lot of people I've interacted with and that's how I know what's going on in the riding and how I'm able to represent people, one of the ways I'm able to represent people um, in Ottawa. And then you can take all of those back to when the committees are debating. You are on a lot Absolutely. of committees. Yeah. You are committees, Japan, China, Europe, yes, security. The, and and it is, it is, um, it's fascinating because uh, of the experience that you acquire from being on committees or being part of parliamentary associations. And for example, I was just in a country that has a democracy, but it's not a democracy like we would know um, here in Canada. Um, and so you learn a lot by visiting another country and, mm -hmm. and seeing, yes, there are some similarities, but there are some huge differences as well. And it makes me value very much what we have here in Canada. We are so fortunate and so blessed to have, it is a, we have a strong, vibrant economy, uh, not economy, but democracy and mm -hmm. economy, but democracy. And um, you really see it when you visit certain countries and you realize, wow, it's not as strong or vibrant here. Um, but that's some of the interest that goes in participating in these associations and in these committees. Absolutely. The democracy is, that we have is something that we have to value. The economy, well, then again, that's not entirely in our hands. The economy is a worldwide thing. It is. And but the government has a tremendous impact on the economy. And um, so for, I'll just give you an example. Um, since uh, 2009, sort of the depths of the, of the recession mm -hmm. here in Canada, um, the economy has created 1.2 million jobs. This is very good news because it means, it doesn't mean that no one in Canada is losing their job. For whatever reason, a company downsizes or it just can't make it. But it's important for Canadians to know that there are other jobs to go to. And so, the, and those are 1.2 million net new jobs, mm -hmm. which means that when you take away job losses, there are 1.2 million new jobs left. Most of those are, like the vast majority, 80 to 90 percent, are full-time jobs, good-paying jobs, and 80 to 90 percent are in the private sector, not, not by government. So this is, this is very, very important. It doesn't just happen. It's not just magic, like, oh, aren't we lucky? Um, you have to have solid economic policies that support job growth. And as conservatives, that's what we have. And so we don't take the credit for creating 1.2 million jobs. Companies created that and the economy created that. But we certainly put in place the right conditions, the right policies, the right budgets to allow that to happen, to encourage that to happen. And I'll just, I'll, if I may, I'll give you an example. Please, um, this is yours. Lowering taxes for businesses. So we'll be attacked by the Liberals and by the NDP for lowering taxes on businesses because Sometimes the other parties sometimes see the businesses as easy targets for cash, like, like for taxes, which is money for the government to launch new programs. But we look at businesses and we say, uh, again, someone might think of large businesses, large corporations, but just look around our riding and you see A&W, you see um, St. Hubert, you see medium sized businesses, you see large businesses. They're all creating jobs here in the riding. So our view as conservatives is if you lower their taxes, the businesses are able to keep more of their own hard-earned money. And what do they do with that money? Well, if times are tough, it allows them to get through the tough times without maybe having to lay anybody off. It might allow them to expand, to invest and expand into a new market and hire some new people. And that's where these 1.2 million jobs are coming from. So it's not, oh, we're really lucky in Canada. It wouldn't matter what kind of budgets we had. We would have created 1.2 million jobs. 
Absolutely not. There are sort of job killing measures and job killing budgets and there are job creating budgets and job creating measures and, and we as a Conservative government are on the side of creating jobs and why? Because Canadians want to work, they want to have jobs mm -hmm. and so we should, we should have an economy that will actually um, uh, foster job creation. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, I, I remember there was an announcement recently about a nice grant to one of our local mm -hmm. companies, Potvin Construction. Yes. A beautiful success story. Yep. But even they need to be retooled and retrained. Absolutely. And there's a lot going on at Potvin. They're a very professional, very competitive company. Mm -hmm. But there's lots of competition out there too. Yeah. And, and uh, competition from other countries even. And so they want to be, um, you know, they want to have very high productivity and they're putting in place a program to improve the efficiency and the productivity of their company and this will allow them to expand into new markets and it will allow them to keep their current employee force in place or mm -hmm. perhaps even grow it. Mm -hmm. So this is good and we, we, would, we support that. As a, I support it as an MP. Mm -hmm. We support it as, uh, as a government with these types of measures to encourage our businesses to create jobs. Do you find yourself trying to <clears throat> of, of course, there's a lot of horse trading that goes on in politics. It's the name of the game by definition. So you are, all of you members of parliament are trying to get as much as you can for your riding. Some are more successful than others. And in your case, do you ever look at how much money is flowing out in taxes and how much is coming back in contributions and grants? Right. So I, I don't have a metric in terms of, you know, how much money is being paid in taxes um, mm -hmm. from my riding. Mm -hmm. But I do have a metric on what we've done as a conservative government for the riding. And um, we, since I was been elected in 2006, I have had the pleasure, I'll say, the, 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 the privilege and the pleasure of announcing, it's in the neighborhood of 155 to $160 million federal dollars for Glengarry Prescott Russell. 130 million has been in infrastructure. And infrastructure is a bit of a, it's a difficult word sometimes for people to, well, what does that mean, infrastructure? Mm -hmm. But like here in Rockland, for example, there was uh, $8 million in federal funding to help uh, with the water treatment plant and the water delivery system that got city water out to the small villages of Clarence Rockland where there was not city water before. Uh, roads and bridges are repaired using federal money um, and that's all across the riding in uh, Hawkesbury, for example, a huge water treatment uh, facility. It cost $36 million total, but we were there for 12. So this all added up uh, arenas, roads, bridges, um, water systems, water treatment systems, all of this uh, funded uh, to a great extent by federal uh, dollars. And this is good for the riding. And this is, this is unprecedented. Um, I, I'm fairly certain that uh, under previous governments, this type of funding has never been delivered to this riding. So you're not only looking at how you generate the money, you're also looking at different priorities such as health, education, money generating capacity of the different businesses. There's a, there's a whole lot of things that you have to balance off. There are, and have, so have right. So, so so farming. There, there are a couple of keys here um, to to the economy and to budgets and to how we do things as conservatives, which is different than the way the NDP would do it or the way that the Liberals would do it. As I mentioned, tax cuts are are an important aspect of the Conservative plan, not so much the Liberal plan or the NDP plan. They, the Liberals, for example, would believe in raising taxes. Why? So the government has more revenue. Why does the government want more revenue? To launch more programs. So that's a model, but that's completely different than our policy, which is the government should live within its means, not necessarily grow. It should live within its means, and we should lower taxes for Canadians. So I spoke about businesses, but I'm also talking about um, uh, uh, mothers and fathers and single people who work, they earn money too, their own hard-earned money. And the less of it they send to Ottawa, the better. They should keep more of their hard-earned money. Mm -hmm. and, but here's how it all works. So the, because of our tax cuts as Conservatives, the average Canadian family, which let's just say it's two, two parents, two children, pays $3,400 less right now in taxes, federal taxes, than they did under the, the previous Liberal government. Even known fact? That's a lot of money. Like imagine the average 
parents saying, you know mm -hmm. what, I've got an extra $3,400 in my pocket mm -hmm. because I'm not paying that in tax. This is huge. But what do, the, what do the parents do with that money? What do, what do people do with money when it's in their pocket? They spend it. And when they spend that money in the economy, let's just say everybody... Uh, in the economy, hopefully not somewhere down in the south. <laughs> yeah, like in the economy and in, mm -hmm. hopefully in our local economy, right? Mm -hmm. And let's just say everyone decided, well, let's go buy a car. The car uh, business would say, gee, car sales are up. I need to hire more businessmen, uh, more salesmen. So they create jobs. So not everyone is buying a car, but the point is, is that the $3,400 is going back into the economy. It is boosting the sales of companies who say, hey, we're doing fairly well right now. I'd like to hire another employee or another five employees to take advantage of this. I want to expand into a new market. So what happens is, is the tax savings help Canadians. They have more of their hard-earned money, but it helps the economy. It helps businesses. Jobs are created. And then Canadians have jobs. So this has been a very good overview of what you've been dealing with until now. We have to take a break, and when sure. we come back, I would like to talk about what we're going to be, what you are going to be dealing with from now until the the elections, very good. when your new portfolio as uh, parliamentary secretary for veterans affairs. Very good. All right. Thank you. Your health tips for healthy living. Falls and slips can occur when clearing the pathway and driveway to your home during the winter months. To prevent any accidents, keep salt or sand by the door to avoid falling or slipping. Make sure to use adequate footwear with good traction. Using ice and snow grips can greatly reduce the risk of a fall. And finally, take frequent breaks so you don't overexert yourself. TV Bingo, live from the TVC22 studio every Sunday nights at 7.15 on TVC22 or on the internet at www.tvc22.ca. So we're back now after that break and we are going to move on and forward. Very good. Into the new world from farming to veterans affairs. You must be a little bit sad to leave behind your farming associations. And yeah, I, I don't leave them behind still. because I'm still the member of parliament for a very agricultural region. And I, and I think people who drive through the riding, who live in the riding, they just know from looking at the farms and the barns and the dairy, uh, chickens, mm -hmm. uh, the fields. We live in a very agricultural based economy here in the riding. And I still work extremely closely with our farmers. But it was a great privilege to be the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Agriculture. It was a job I did for six years, which is a very long time for a Parliamentary Secretary to be in one portfolio. Um, but it allowed me to represent farmers, um, both in the House and when I travelled internationally, and when I certainly when I worked with the Minister. And the minister, Minister Jerry Ritz, he's been the agriculture minister for seven years. So in a sense, we've been a, a bit of a dynamic duo for, for mm -hmm. his seven years, my six years, uh, where we've worked extremely well together, um, advancing uh, important issues for our farmers. And I think our farmers know the, di the changes that we have brought about to support agriculture here in Canada. And, and actually, farming is doing very well. Like when we were first elected in 2006, um, farmers were very unhappy, actually. Um, a lot of farmers from our region were actually driving their tractors downtown to protest. That's how unhappy I they were. That. Yeah, but this is, a, this is a whole different scenario now. And farmers, you know, there, there's always up and down in terms of crops and crop prices, but they know that what we have done as conservatives in terms of agriculture policy, agricultural policy has been to their benefit, and they're seeing the fruit of that, and I think they like that. Well, we certainly want to keep our farmers working well because I think that they, being working on the land, working in, an, in nature and in, an in a beautiful environment, is something that everybody should see, yeah. if not take part in. Yeah. It's healthy. It's it is. healthy. So much I of agree. life is not healthy. So yeah. much of life is not about healthy things. Veterans Affairs. 
They come back and we hear so much about how unhealthy the environment is for them. Uh, we hear about the problems they face. We don't hear about anything that the government is doing for them, but obviously you must have a different perspective. On right. That. So as I mentioned, I served in the military for, uh, for 20 years. So I left when I was at the tender age of 17, uh, left grade 12, so I finished grade 12, but then went to military college um, and served for 20 years. So I do have a very um, keen understanding of what it means to serve um, in the military, and I understand the challenges that many of our veterans are facing. Uh, but the other thing I'll say too is, um, of course I was always following closely what was going on with Veterans Affairs mm -hmm. and with our veterans. And I'm learning more now, um, certainly. And there are areas that require attention. The, the system is not perfect. But I will also say there is a lot of good that is being done by, from, by the government in supporting veterans. It's just, it's not being communicated to Canadians. And uh, I, I liken it to when it's a sunny day, the national media is not interested in reporting it's a sunny day and things are going really well today. Their essence is more on everything that's going negative. And the challenge here is that there's a lot that's going well for veterans, but if the media sort of pick a story and it's a negative story and then they don't report on the good and then there's another negative story and they don't report on the good but there's another negative story, then Canadians only see the negative stories and they go, well, everything is broken. Nothing is working for our veterans. And it's simply not the case. So much is working well for our veterans. It's just, I feel Canadians should have access to the good and to the problem areas. Then they have a fully informed, um, uh, I guess, intellect in terms of deciding, well, okay, you know, how are veterans being served? There's a lot of controversy about the war, about military service to begin with, but certainly once putting that aside, and that's the realm of national defense and external aff foreign affairs probably, but once they come back, we want these people looked after. We, we do Absolutely. want to make sure that they're, the, the horror stories that we hear, many of which I think come from the States, there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot more filtering up here, and stories about how the veterans have to get together to help the veterans because the government's not doing anything for them. Right. I, I can't imagine that the Canadian way is that's not the Canadian way, but there there's some of it. And right. do you have any uh, priorities that you need to attack to make the system more humane? More oh, oh definitely. Uh, let me just give some examples, like just so I can sort of um, mm -hmm. explain some of the good things that exist right now that mm -hmm. people might not be aware of. So. Um, for example, the, the government would want veterans to stay in their homes as opposed to perhaps go to a nursing home. The longer they're in their home, the better. Why is that? It's because they're surrounded by their family and their loved ones. They're living in a familiar environment, their home. They're in a community in which they probably lived for many years, maybe raised their families. It's a great location for them. But they might need some support, for example, some help with uh, clearing the driveway in winter of snow with uh, lawn care, with perhaps house maintenance. There are things like that. Now under the older system, like a while ago, a few years ago, a veteran, for example, would have to pay the snow plow uh, $600, let's say, a year to clear his driveway. And then he would have to take his receipt and file a claim and the claim would go into the bureaucracy and the bureaucracy would vet the claim and make copies and approve the claim and send him a check after a great period of time. And what we have changed as conservatives is, like, is that a veteran now, we look at his individual circumstances and we say, we see the house you live in, we see what your costs are to, to maintain your house, we're here to help, we're just gonna write you a check. Um, to provide that assistance, financial assistance, right up front. Do not send us receipts, just keep them. Uh, if we need, we'll ask. But generally, we don't, we don't ask. So what does that mean? Well, that means that the veteran now is getting uh, upfront payment for home care so he can help him stay in his home. This is a good thing. Mm -hmm. It also means that we were able to downsize what I call some of the backroom bureaucracy that was, that was dealing with all of, all of those claims. So, you know, let's just, for the sake of argument, say there were 100 people that would have to take all the receipts and verify them that they were valid and photocopy them and, you know, vet them against the claim and approve the claim. There was a whole bureaucracy that supported that, but we were able to downsize that bureaucracy and the media might report or what might come to mind is when you downsize the bureaucracy, oh, the service is worse. You must be cutting the service at the same time. But this is a great example where the service to the veteran is actually better 
He's getting money up front, just has to hold the receipts at home, don't mail in a claim. Uh, it's all being looked after, and we've cut backroom bureaucracy. And then what does that mean if you cut the backroom bureaucracy? What it means is that you're able to spend more money on the veteran himself or herself. And just to give you an example, right now, again, this is something that's not well known by Canadians. Funding for Veterans Affairs is at its highest level in Canadian history. It's never been higher than it is today. And 90% of the budget is delivered directly to veterans or to services that help veterans and their families. And this is a tremendously high delivery rate, 90%. That means the administrative costs are 10%. And this is something to be uh, sought after and envied by many organizations to have such a small administrative cost in delivering such significant funding. Sure, it's well, well worth mentioning. And why is it not mentioned? What's wrong with the communications <laughs> well, department? <laughs> yeah, we, we try to get that out. And for example, we in question period, when we're asked questions, we, we respond with that type of response. It, it, I like that kind of a response because it's got some um, quantitative data to it. It's not just a line. It's actually, hey, we're delivering 90 cents on the dollar to the veteran. The budget is the highest it's ever been in Canadian history. This, these are all good things, but it doesn't, it doesn't make it into the media stories. And as a result, I feel Canadians don't have the full picture of what's happening. And I'm not saying everything's perfect. There are areas where we need to focus, but I am saying there's a lot of good news stories out there too, just like this one. Uh, there are many others as well. It's just, we have to communicate that to Canadians so they have a fuller picture. Hmm. This is probably not a fair question to ask you because it's not even your area, but uh, it's well, well, it's publicized that the Conservative government is not very friendly with the media, certainly not with the CBC, and perhaps this might be part of the root of the problem that they're not getting, they're, they don't feel they're getting fair coverage. It's, um, what, what you have are, are, are really um, different organizations with sort of different things they'd like to accomplish. Mm -hmm. So we do work with the media. Um, you know, our ministers give, uh, you know, press conferences. I work with our local media extremely well. And, I, and actually, uh, I do want to yes, draw that. Yes, you do. Yeah, Here and I want to draw that there's a big <laughs> distinction between local media and the national media. And that's yes. why I keep putting the word national in, um, because there is a difference between them. But we do work with the media, maybe not in the way that they would like us to work with them. So, um, but we're also very focused on getting messages out to Canadians as well. So through the media, but through other means as well. So um, we, have a, we do have a relationship. Uh, sometimes it's very positive, sometimes a little bit less, but that, that's also just part of, of governing and it's part of media. It kind and of, it's part of a free country. Yeah, it is, it is, yeah, yeah, very much so. We don't control our media. Yeah, that's right, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, the other side of veterans is, of course, the ones who are at home, who are able to be at home, and then there's those who cannot be at home, who, are, who have been just destroyed either psychologically or physically by the war. Right. by their service. It's tragic. There seems to be more and more of it, or maybe we just hear more and more of it. Right. This must be something that goes deep to your core. I, I think there, there, is, uh, there, there is more, uh, because there, there are veterans who served in World War I, World War II, Korea, um, and um, actually not so much World War I now. I believe the last veteran passed away just, just uh, not too long ago. But certainly World War II in Korea, we have veterans. But what we're seeing is with newer veterans, veterans who are much younger, uh, who might have been involved in Afghanistan, who were involved in Bosnia. Um, and I think that there, there, there are more mental health challenges uh, resulting from PTSD. So what are we doing about that? And, and here's another good news story. Um, before Christmas, we announced as a government that we were going to, uh, we are going to spend $200 million, which is a big number. It doesn't really mean much when I say 200 million, but what it means on the ground is um, opening nine new offices, mental health clinics, to provide mental health services to veterans. These clinics will be available across Canada, and there will be a place that the veteran can go to to receive services that he needs, particularly if they're mental health um, issues. Well, that's very encouraging because we, we do hear about the, the penitentiaries and what the, the Conservative government is doing there, but we don't, I haven't heard about this initiative. Right, so, so and that's, that's why I'm kind of happy to mention it here today because it's a very positive initiative, it's, it's very well received, and it is very much focused 
on, as I say, younger veterans um, who might be suffering from PTSD. The, another very uh, interesting program that is being launched with that $200 million is support for families. So we want to provide what we call um, uh, critical training for families so that they can identify PTSD, so they can see the indicators and know what to do because mm -hmm. sometimes the veteran himself is not sure what he's going through, mm -hmm. but his family can see the signs, but they're not sure what the signs are. So we want to train the family in sort of a first aid, mental health first aid um, type of approach where they, if they see certain indicators, they'll say, oh, we think mm -hmm. this needs, this needs some, some medical attention. So that type of training for families is, is very important. Um, and it's all part of that $200 million in providing uh, improved services for mental health for our veterans. We often hear about how veterans come back and they've been in such an intense situation in a war zone and everything is alert and they come back and they're, they're looking for things. They're, they're hypervigilant, hyper alert, whatever the term is. They, they, don't have, they lose their sense of direction. They don't know what to do with themselves and nothing seems normal. And the, the programs that I've heard of, and I'm not saying that we don't have them in Canada, I just haven't heard about them, is to give them a purpose, give them a job, give them something to do. Great. I am so glad that you raise it in that way because that is what is at the heart of um, helping our veterans. Uh, being in the military is a very unique type of service to our country. And the conditions are extremely difficult, can be extremely difficult. They're exceptional, meaning they're, they're not part of sort of normal, what we would say civilian life here in Canada. And you're right, when someone comes back from a mission, um, they have to transition back into society and back into what we in the military call civvy life, like civilian life. <laughs> and, um, Silly life, did you say? You know, civvy, civvy. <laughs> and so, um, uh, that's exactly where these programs are aimed. They're aimed at helping the veteran reintegrate into society and to get a job. Because if he has a job, he can raise his family. And so we provide a tremendous amount of uh, funding to individual veterans to help them develop skill sets that will help them get jobs. Mm -hmm. And we actually have very targeted programs too, for example, to move uh, veterans into um, construction type jobs. So it's called helmets to hard hats. This is something we've worked very closely with the construction industry to, to provide the training necessary to move veterans into the construction industry and to also work with the employers of construction workers to bring veterans in. There's another initiative which we just passed before Christmas. Uh, the NDP did not support this, but we felt very strongly about it as conservatives. For government type jobs, if two people were to apply and they, they were both um, competent, meaning they, they both had the skill set necessary for the job, but one of them was a veteran, he would get preferential treatment. So, and why would he get preferential treatment? Because he's a veteran, that's why. And so this is a, this is a great example of a, of, a, of a bill that's passing into law, it's in the Senate right now, it's passing into law that will directly help veterans who are looking for work. And then we also provide, um, as I mentioned, substantial funding. It's, I want to say it's in the neighborhood of up to $70,000 um, for formal education to help veterans develop skill sets that will help them to find jobs and, and, and secure jobs. When they have jobs, they're able to raise their families, they're able to move ahead uh, and, like you said, be engaged in society and have a very forward-looking vision. So this is, this is absolutely critical. And uh, this is exactly where we're working and where we're having success. Well, that's wonderful to hear. And there is so much to be done in this country and in other countries. I noticed that you're on all of these committees, all of these international committees. And uh, they, when, I, when I see that, the, the thought that popped into my mind was the idea of sister cities, the twin oh, right. cities. Yes, yes. You know yeah. how we, we, we team up with some place else that needs our help that we can learn from and the vet, who would be better but the, than the veterans who, who really go to protect people and now right. finally they could do it without being shot at. Right, right. Another idea, another project. Yeah. <laughs> it would be nice to see a lot of these uh, veterans out on the farms too, but now with farms so mechanized. It's hard to think of. Farmers are always looking for people to work on their farms. It's actually one of the challenges that farmers have. It is having employees work on their farm. 
Mm. Uh, and yes, uh, farming is is uh, highly mechanized. You know, when you see sort of tractors and you see how cows are milked these days, but there's still uh, a very strong need for people to work on farms, mm -hmm. and it's always been one of the challenges that farmers have faced. So there's another option. Absolutely. Le GF Show, c'est quoi? Bienvenue au GF Show, c'est un tout nouveau TV show, on va dire. Ah ouais, vas-y, let's go! Je sais pas si vous allez me trouver pas. Bienvenue tout le monde au GF Show, c'est un tout nouveau um. TV show. Vous allez voir, je suis pas que le numéro, on va avoir du fun, mon oh, oui. Le GF Show, c'est de l'humour, de l'entertainment, du divertissement, des sketchs, des parodies, des conneries, des observations, des chroniques, j'en passe. Le GF Show, c'est tout, c'est n'importe quoi. C'est pour vous autres, c'est à DMC 22 que c'est chaud. Ne le manquez pas. TV Bingo, live from the TVC22 studio every Sunday nights at 7.15 on TVC22 or on the internet at www.tvc22.ca Your health. Tips for healthy living. Driving in severe winter conditions can be challenging and dangerous. Here are a few tips that can help keep you safe while driving. Be alert and slow down in the winter. Maintain a safe distance from vehicles in front of you. A four-second distance is ideal in slippery conditions. When possible, drive during daylight hours. And consider taking a winter driving course so you can learn how to brake safely, how to get out of a skid, and how your car handles in winter weather. So you've been, you're, you are a finely trained individual. You've had your years of military service. Well, you are. It, it's clear. It comes through in you. you. You are clear and you're competent and you're eloquent. You've had your 20 years in the military. You've had your nine years in politics. You've learned so much and you've given so much. If when the elections are, if the result of the elections is that you don't get to keep your, your riding, what does a person like you do? <laughs> are you going to be? Are you going to be like one of those veterans coming back with? I don't know what to do with all of these skills. What a waste that would be for us. No, I, I think um, you know. I think I have a, a wide variety of skill sets, okay. but I'm not actually thinking that way. I, I think I think the the way people view me, which is actually the way I am, is I'm always very focused on what my responsibilities are right now. I I tend not to be looking and having sort of all sorts of plans for the future that may or may not come to pass. I, I work very much um, in a direction. I try to be as effective and as efficient as I can. I pour heart and soul into what I'm doing, and then I move forward. And in this case, it's serving people as the Member of Parliament and doing all those things that we spoke about earlier in the show and others in order to serve people well and to serve our country well. If at some point that circumstance would, were to change, then I think I would have a look around at that point and say, okay, circumstances have just changed, um, what next? Uh, but up until that point, I've always found it better to focus on sort of the here and now and just the, the near term future and there's plenty to keep me busy uh, in my day to day responsibilities as a member of parliament and as a husband and as a father. Mm -hmm. um, so putting all of that together, um, you know, that, that's sort of a full-time engagement for me and I'm working right now. I, I would like to continue as the Member of Parliament. I've really enjoyed my nine years and as I mentioned, I've, I found it really to be uh, an honour and a privilege to serve in this capacity and uh, I would like to continue. So uh, I am going to be putting my name forward when the next election is called and I, I'm, I'm happy that I have a, a, a a strong track record upon which to run. But it's going to be the people here that decide. It's going to be the people in the riding that decide um, whether they would like me to continue uh, to represent them or not. And that'll be the decision that they make. And I, I, I remember in 2006, um, when I was first elected, um, at the time, it was thought that a Conservative just cannot win here. That's just not possible. And um, 
I, uh, I I'll tell you the story because I was telling it to the kids uh, in school mm -hmm. uh, when I was talking to the three schools uh, just yesterday. And I was saying, you know, I ran and there were 50, more than 50,000 people that went out to vote. So I, I'll always ask the kids, does anyone want to guess how many votes I won by when you think about 50,000 people voting? And I, you know, I always say, and, you know, some of you probably went to the polls with your parents. You know, who went to the polls with their parents to see about <laughs> voting? You know, where your dad said, come on, get in the car, we're going to vote. You know, all the hands go up. And I said, right, that's a ballot box. So what do you think I won by? You know, uh, you know 50,000, nope. Uh, 20,000, nope. And uh, finally, they, they don't generally guess, and I'll say, well, I won by 200 votes. But what does that mean, 200 votes? And, I, and I'll explain to them, it means one vote per ballot box. That's what I won by in 2006, because there were 200 ballot boxes across the riding, so people could vote in their communities. And at the end of the election night, I won by, on average, one vote per ballot box. And the reason, I'll, I'll explain to you, the reason I'm telling you this is because there will be a day when you turn 18 and you will have the ability to vote and our democracy is so vitally important to who we are as Canadians. You need to vote because that one vote per ballot box could determine who represents you as a member of parliament. And there is this temptation to think, oh, my vote doesn't matter. But I'm here to say, actually, your vote does matter because if I had had one person in each community to say, well, you know what, I'm too tired to vote today. Or I just, oh, the weather's not quite right for me. Uh, that would have changed everything. But instead, I was elected by that one vote per ballot box. And it grew. Like in 2008, I was elected by, um, I won by 5,000 votes. In 2011, it was by 10,000 votes. So it's been growing. But I'll never forget that first evening in 2006. Yeah, about, about you know, um, winning that election and by such a narrow margin. But that, it was at that point where, okay, I am now the Member of Parliament and I'm going to work heart and soul to be a good Member of Parliament. And so that's why it's hard for me to answer what would I do afterwards. I'm sort of not at that point yet. I'm running again. I've got a solid track record. I want to continue representing. I would like to do that, um, continue representing the people of the riding. I hope they continue to have confidence in me. And I'm going to be working like a tiger um, to win the next election. And then let's just see what happens at, on election night. Well, you know, I'm really glad that I asked that question. I wasn't going to, and I'm really glad you answered it the way you did, because we live in a society where uncertainty is something that scares us. We, mm. we want everything to be organized and programmed, and it's got to be this way, and it's got to be this way till the end of our days. And it's less that way in society today than it was 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. And at least even somebody like you is who who is capable of doing and who has proven himself can say, well, everything might change and then I will just adapt. Right. Yeah, you have and that's to, what you have to do. Yeah, you have to do that. You have to be resilient yes. and, uh, <laughs> and be ready to adapt, but you need to be fully engaged at where you're at as well. That's right. So, yes. Now, it's often said, getting back to the point about voting, that we have a duty to vote because that's what so many of our veterans have gone out and fought for, and so many of our young men and women have died for to protect our right to vote. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see it that way? Is that something that's... Oh, very, very much so. Um, in Canada, we have a strong, vibrant democracy. And when I've traveled a little bit around the world and gone to other countries, you see different democracies. They're all democracies. Uh, but some are not as strong and some are not as vibrant and some are not as healthy. Canada really has the best of it all. And um, our democracy is founded upon the people of Canada. And them exercising their vote is such an important part of our democracy. And it is so vitally important to who we are as a country, to who we have representing us as members of parliament and as a government. And so um, I really do encourage people to vote and to exercise that vote. And I understand some of the intimidation because I remember, especially when I was younger, I remember you feel that um, you don't understand all the issues. You, know, you need to be an expert to vote. You need to understand everything to vote. And it's so untrue. Um, and I will say to, again, high school students, I'll say you might feel that way, that you need to understand everything about politics in order to vote. But your parents don't understand everything about politics. They just understand what's important to them and you vote on what's important to you. And so just to give an example, we were talking before about low taxes. If the idea of 
low taxes is important to you. You want to keep more of your money. You're not so interested in uh, bigger spending programs. That really might be all you need to know. Uh, or perhaps you um, might have come from another country and you like our policy regarding that country, that might be enough for you to go and vote. You might have four or five issues that you're tracking, but you don't need to track all the political issues in order to vote. Mm -hmm. So you really just have to know what's important to you. You try to get information from the different parties on these issues that are important to you, and then you make the best informed decision that you can make. The most important thing is that you've gone to exercise your right to vote. And I would like to add to that, that not only is it the issues that are important, but the person that you're voting for. And it's so difficult to get to know the people because so many are slick talkers these days mm. and have handlers who make them look good. Or, and then all of a sudden this horrible news comes out down the road and suddenly it's, the, we never knew him, you never knew her. Right. So in my interviews, as with you, I'm always more focused on letting the viewers find out a little bit more about you as a person right then about the issues because the issues oh my god the experts will talk will weigh one way on a certain issue will yeah. weigh another way on another and at the end of the day we don't really know high taxes low taxes which are the better how how are people going to react right so and I, and I think I think that goes back to why I feel it's so important to be very present in the riding to go to these events because if you're meeting people face to face one on one or in groups and you're present at all of these events and so that's where people see you and get to know you and they right. chat with you and they or they just see you some people are just happy to see you they don't need to talk to you but just seeing you sends, is enough for them so i think i think that being very present in the riding and i also have this policy that anyone who wants to see me can see me in my offices like by all means like uh, my staff if they're able to sort of sort out an issue before it requires me great perfect but if someone wants to see me despite all of that Great, let's set up a meeting. And same with phone calls. When people call, um, sometimes they can get a, excuse me, a quicker response from my staff, which is fine, great. Mm -hmm. But if they say, well, listen, I still want Pierre to call me. Okay, I'll make every possible effort to call. And sometimes it's hard because, you know, if people aren't home, you leave a message, you leave two messages. But, but it's important. And, uh, and I actually appreciate it. I tell people I appreciate it when you call me because I need to know what you're thinking. That's, if I'm going to represent you, I need to know... And you know, some people are, well, I, I, you know, I'm sorry to say this. Don't be sorry. Just tell me. I need to know. So I'm very open that way. And, and I, think, I think it helps with people getting to know me as their representative on a, on a personal level. Getting to know you as a person would be an easy thing. Getting to understand how you do what you do would be <laughs> beyond our capacity for most of us. I mean, how, how do you get out there and talk to all of these people? And at the end of the day, every single exchange drains you a little bit. It, yes, it energizes you, but it drains you also. And then you have to go back and you have to read all those reams and reams of documents. So obviously politics is not for everybody. Yeah, I think you're right. I think politics is not for everybody. Um, it's, I have found for me it's been a great fit. Um, and I, I, I do have... I guess, deep reserves of energy. And there's a lot that motivates me in this line of work. Um, and so, um, you know, there are days where, I, where I'm absolutely exhausted. <laughs> Those days come, but you know what? Those days go. And then there are other things that are stimulating and exciting. And certainly being out on the ground, is all, it is always stimulating and exciting because you're interacting with people. And I've always found that to be interesting. And I, I like learning about people as well. So yeah, they get a chance to meet me, but I get a chance to meet them. And, um, you know, and it's really touching. Uh, I've been to many community-based events that have just flowered up to support an individual or a family in the community. And I just, I marvel that this is not an annual event, that, you know, a family was in need or an individual was in need, someone found out about it, they pulled together a team of 20 volunteers, they threw together like an event or, or they organized an event, not just necessarily threw it together, and they drew in 250 people from the community. And you're going, where did all these people come from and what community spirit? And that is motivating. You, you, when I plug into an event like that, you go, wow, I'm so touched by all of the people that are here to support this person or this family or this cause. And that's just very touching and very motivating. And as I mentioned, every community is different in its own special way. And yeah. 
and it's, it's just very, very good to see. Well, the experience of the St. Albert Cheese uh, Cooperative oh, just absolutely. recently, that, that was a perfect Tremendous example. resilience uh, in St. Albert. Like that, that was a devastating fire for the community, yeah. uh, devastating obviously for the cheese factory. And now look, like they, they have a state-of-the-art, world-class cheese production facility there. Their network is expanding. The community is just fully engaged. It's a great success story. And while they were build, rebuilding, they were winning awards. Yes, exactly. Go figure. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. No, obviously with, with our society, the way it's grown and dispersed, it's very difficult to maintain that momentum of a small village. But at the core, we're still the same people. Yeah. People care, people want to help. They do. We're, we're peaceful, loving, and it's very sad when the, the society becomes so fra factioned and fractioned and cut up into this party or that party. Could you ever see a world where we don't have party lines, where people, mem representatives, just talk to each other and that solve does problems happen. together? It, it, this is one of the things I've noticed as a, as a member of parliament. There's what happens in the House of Commons during question period. And I'll say, unfortunately, that's the window that Canadians generally have. Like, that's yeah. the little clip that goes on uh, the news. And of the 45 minutes of question period, you're lucky if you get 10 seconds on the news. So you're just seeing a slice of a little part of a day on the hill. And what Canadians don't see is some of the collegiality between MPs, um, MPs working together. It's not all like mortal combat. <laughs> There's a lot of teamwork and there is, you know, and when, when things happen, like for example, when the gunman entered Parliament Hill, everybody kind of realizes we're all MPs, like mm -hmm. we're all elected representatives. We have this commonality amongst ourselves and we were all threatened by that. So that was a very unifying moment. Um, you know, but back in question period, question period has a purpose and that's what Canadians see. Would I ever see a day where there would be no parties? I don't think so because the way I think of it is, is uh, it's a bit like sports, it's a bit like soccer, let's say. You have to have a team. You got to play on a team. Like if you just had 18 players running around the field, you know, how, how would that work? So you generally have teams and, and I kind of take the analogy a little bit further. It's the way I sort of see the role as an MP as well. An MP is not about me, it's not about myself. So for example, you cannot, you, you got to play as part of a team. You can't have three guys playing the goalie all at the same time because you know what, that's what they want to do. That doesn't work well for the team either. And if everyone's playing their position and playing as part of a team, you know, I as a player may have a really good, mo a really good uh, move or a really good shot on goal and I scored, I might have scored two or three times, but I couldn't have done it without the team. Mm -hmm. Like it would be wrong for me to say, well, I did that, I'm great. Uh, no, that's, okay. that's the completely wrong perspective because to get the ball up the field or to get the ball to you in order to score, that took a team. And so I see the team having great value um, in terms of, the, the, there is a consequence. The consequence is sort of the political friction that, that comes sometimes with having parties. But on the other side, you also have different ways of doing things. And this is what comes out in debate. You've got a bill in front of the house and you have parties debating that bill and that's where you get these different points of view. And that's where you get people on the same side trying to move forward with that legislation or trying to slow it down depending on what their approach is. Well, certainly if you don't give people the freedom to speak their minds and express their different points of view, then you can't be sure that you're coming up with the right solution. Right, and so what I'd like to tell people is there is healthy debate in the mm -hmm. House of Commons. Question period is not debate. Question period is where mm. uh, the opposition asks you know, challenging, difficult, and, you know, ramped up questions to the government, and the government uh, tries to show that, no, that, that's under control, and, you know, here's a positive initi initiative we're doing. The rest of the day, it's only 45 minutes in the day, the rest of the day from 10 in the morning till 7 at night when the house is open is debate on bills and on motions. And it's generally very reasoned debate. It's, uh, it, can be, it can be passionate, but it's not necessarily confrontational. There, and, but that's a slice, that, that, that's a part of the day that Canadians generally don't see unless you go into Parliament and into the gallery and say, oh, this is debate. Oh, mm -hmm. I see. Oh, I'm hearing different points of view now. Oh, I understand. So, so question period, it's actually, it's, it's its own little confrontational arena. But unfortunately, that's all Canadians really see of Parliament. But it's not like that every minute of every day. You know, it's a funny thing because we had uh, rather... 
We had, a, we had a council, a municipal council, that had a lot of problems until the recent elections, and now it's a, it's a council that seems to be working much better. So many people were watching the council meetings on TV and attending them with the previous council, and now nobody shows up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not entertainment anymore. It's, okay, they're doing their job. This is fine. Right. So everything's okay. But people should still show up people should still pay attention because there's a, there could always be a piece of the puzzle that you're missing. That sure. The yep. representative is missing. And yep. these days. But I understand too, like, like people are busy. They have their lives. You know, they're, yes. they've got their work. They're raising their family. They've got sports. They've got commitments. They've got a lot of stuff going on. So I think it is helpful when they, when they do keep an eye on politics. But I do understand completely, you know, not everyone is focused on politics. They have other lives too. <laughs> That's an incredibly generous thing for you to say, considering what your life is like. <laughs> but then again, it is your life, and that's why you're the one doing that job and not right. the rest of us. And yeah, that's why we need representatives. Well, thank you. Yeah, a life freely chosen. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I, th I don't know. None of us know what's going to happen at the next elections, and we all know that everything, there are so many variables that come into play. But I would say that most of the... Most of your constituents are pretty grateful that you're the one who's been representing oh, thank them. thank you. Thank you. you. You certainly have put your heart and soul into it and brought so much openness that we can, we can only emulate that if we look for our next, our, our next representative. Well, thank you. And you've always made yourself available for the TV station. Oh, which I'm happy to. A gazillion demands on your time. So a little bit in awe, very much grateful. My pleasure. And all the power to you. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you, you very, very much. much. Thanks yeah. for having me here today. Thank you. All right. Le GF Show, c'est quoi? Bienvenue au GF Show. C'est un tout nouveau TV show. On va dire. Ah ouais. Voici, let's go. Je sais pas si vous allez me trouver pas. Bienvenue tout le monde au GF Show. C'est un tout nouveau um. TV show. Vous allez voir, je suis pas que numéro. On va avoir <laughs> Le GF Show, c'est de l'humour, de l'entertainment, du divertissement, des sketchs, des parodies, des conneries, des observations, des chroniques, et j'en passe. Le GF Show, c'est tout, c'est n'importe quoi. C'est pour vous autres, c'était M. Nadeau qui s'est chaud. Ne le manquez pas. Mesdames et messieurs, bienvenue au GF Show. Informez-vous avec Jacques est une émission d'intérêt public à but non lucratif qui couvre tout ce qui se passe dans notre belle région de Clarence Rockland. Animé par Jacques Tessier, sur place, il assemble entrevues avec des moments cocasses sur les organisations et événements qui se déroulent durant l'année. Jacques s'intéresse à vous et est là pour vous informer de ce qui se passe chez vous. Informez-vous avec Jacques à TVC22 ou sur Internet à www.tvc22.ca. Catalyn Poor invites you to watch her show, Cats About Town, where she talks and interviews local people about their jobs and other interesting subjects. Catalyn asks good and interesting questions that cover topics that makes us think about our city and society in general. Catalyn cares for our community and shares her perspective and thoughts about life. Don't miss Cats About Town on TVC22 or on the internet at www.tvc22.ca.